providing STEM education by way of future sports. I'm Tanya Hall, and joining me is Mark Kornblatt, founder, chief creative officer, and chief innovation officer at the Museum of Future Sports. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Thanks for having me. What is the Museum of Future Sports all about, and what motivated you to create it? The Museum of Future Sports is really a, a one-of-a-kind institution, but I think it's going to represent a, a trend that we start to see more and more. And the basic idea is that we're putting an umbrella around emerging uh, technology-enabled games and sports. The most popular that people would be familiar with would be video games and esports. But our background, my company's background, is actually in drone sports, drone racing, and combat. And we realized that all of these tech-enabled sports were really part of a larger ecosystem. And so the Museum of Future Sports is dedicated to bringing all of this new innovate, innovative technology together and create communities and develop communities around that, and then actually give back to the communities by providing STEM and STEAM education programs to kids so that they grow up appreciating that if they want to be an esports star, there is actually a path to do that. And the more uh, versed they are in technology and uh, the STEAM education uh, topics, the better chances they'll have to be able to compete in the future. All right, tell us about Sparky and how this actually got you started. <laughs> Sparky uh, is a robot that I started working on the project in the early 90s, and it's actually an acronym for Self-Portrait Artifact Roving Chassis, or Sparky for short. And it was a two-way video chat telepresence robot on wheels, completely wireless. The original technology of Sparky predated the internet and social media and, and video chat uh, technologies by a few years, so it was all very much an analog project. It was built from found electric wheelchair parts and old TV sets. And when we wanted to create the video transmission uh, uh, technology, we actually had to build those from scratch. Nowadays, you can buy all of that over the counter. And in our world of drone racing, a lot of that technology is really cheap. But back then, I used to have to hide in a room or a broom closet or nearby and have the robot like out in a gallery or a, a, a venue. And I'd be hidden in the other room doing video chat over maybe a 30 or 50 foot distance. Over the years, as the internet uh, and the bandwidth speeds got better and video chat got better, we continually upgraded Sparky so that now Sparky is a completely digitally enabled robot where the video chat and all the controls of the robot are, are coming through uh, uh, high-speed wireless. How do the games and competitions of, of the 21st century future sports differ in terms of fan and spectator engagement from traditional 20th century sports? I look at traditional sports in many ways as, oh, we call them analog sports. Of course, they're utilizing technologies in all sorts of ways, but at the core, so many of the sports that we love are basically playing with a ball on a field, maybe with a bat or a basket or whatever. But technology-enabled sports obviously have tech really at the core, if it's drone racing or if it's esports or robot combat or jetpack racing, clearly the technology is the, the critical factor in developing this new uh, activity. Along with that comes new ways of engaging with that sport. And we now have an opportunity to create very much asymmetrical experiences where sports can be experienced by the players using uh, virtual reality or mixed reality goggles. The audience can be viewing it either live or viewing it online through streaming, or they can also be using it through some mediated technology like goggles or some other uh, technologies like that. And so all of a sudden, we have opportunities to not just create new sports with technologies, but whole new ways for the fans to engage and indeed even interact with those games and sports. You can imagine if you had, uh, say, like a robot combat game going on, spectators could maybe kind of dial in and have a trackside uh, cannon that shoots uh, ping pong balls or, or tennis balls, and the audience could be in control of that. Indeed, they could even be in control of competitors in the playing field. Um, so right now, uh, no pun intended, the sky is the limit in terms of what we can do in creating new experiences for the audience to engage with these tech sports. You say that esports involves many more players and spectators than NFL, NASCAR, and even the music industry combined. With something that large, why don't we hear more about them? You know, I think we are beginning to hear more about it. 
One thing that seems clear is that esports are very appealing to uh, the youth in particular, although certainly people of all ages are getting uh, familiar with it and following the, the world of esports. But the youth, really, they have a different way of uh, consuming media than folks in our generations and older do. And so these things are happening and they have enormous followings. Uh, just this last weekend, the uh, Fortnite uh, World Championships occurred, which again, most people in the mainstream media probably aren't too aware of. There is one story, interesting story, that is starting to emerge from it in that one of the winners of the uh, individual competition uh, was a 15-year-old boy who won $3 million. So even though most people aren't that familiar with esports, somehow that story has found its way into the mainstream when it comes to this particular event. But it was held in uh, Arthur Ashe Stadium, which is a, an enormous venue, and it was filled to the rafters, and it was... I think it broke records online for uh, live um, viewership of the live stream was uh, several million uh, concurrent viewers. So we're at a cusp point right now where some of us like old folks may not be too aware of it, but if we're not aware of it now, we will be soon because the generations that are coming up behind us and sort of putting their, uh, their games and their sports out into the mainstream, that's what they're doing. They're not pursuing soccer and hockey and football and baseball the way we would have as youth. They're pursuing these esports. And when they talk about being a, a successful athlete, they're talking about playing Fortnite and uh, Call of Duty. What for you put the A in STEAM? Well, I've always identified as an artist, and even though I've been running sports organizations for the last decade or so, I've never divorced the creative development from that process, which is probably why I'm involved in developing new and innovative sports as, as opposed to getting involved in traditional sports. But creativity is often overlooked. And even when we talk about STEM education programs, which is uh, science, uh, technology, engineering, and math, the creative arts are often overlooked and uh, left out of that equation. And I think they're equally as important when it comes to childhood development and education. Uh, in a way, I think we're all born as creative geniuses. And as we go through life and school and other experiences, a lot of that creativity gets uh, beaten out of us in one way or another. And so for me, anything that we can do to get people to acknowledge that they are in fact creative, they don't have to identify as an artist, but they can embrace their inner creativity. And that can lend itself not just to you know, painting and sculpting, but it can lend itself to programming and web development and game design. And so for a lot of these kids who come and say, I want to be a Fortnite champion, we kind of say to them, sure, you can play any game you want, but you have to build the game first. And then immediately they, immediately they realize that all the cool stuff in the game is created by creative people. And so putting the A in STEAM and turning STEM into STEAM is actually one of the uh, cornerstones of what we're trying to do at the Museum of Future Sports. How do we bridge the gap between the haves and the have-nots in, in future sports? Because th there is a, a problem there. I think there's a problem. I actually look at it more like an opportunity. Most everyone I know who's in esports or drone racing or the world of robot combat or developing technologies for other games most of those people would fall into a category of the haves or, or somewhat privileged. Um, none of this stuff in the world of technology sports comes easily. You can't just run out into the schoolyard and play and invent esports. You need the infrastructure, you need an education, you need technology, you need access to network infrastructure, all sorts of things. And so the people who are engaged in these popular and growing technology sports, I believe have an opportunity to share their knowledge and their access with the larger community. Not just with the other middle-aged guys who come out to the field to race drones on the weekend, but take it into their communities, into the schools where their kids and their nieces and nephews are, and even beyond that, into the schools and their communities that are sorely lacking in the resources to connect with kids over these technologies. So one way to do it is through school, but a more effective way to do it is through what kids love. Kids love the toys and the technologies, they love to compete, they love robots and drones and video games. And so if we can introduce the STEAM education philosophy and technologies through their love of games and competition, then our job is halfway done. Once a kid decides that these are the things that they like, we basically almost get out of the way and let them pursue it because all we can really do is support them in that 
goal and in that dream of pursuing that. And we've actually found that as kids get older in high school and towards graduation, there's so many pressures on them regarding college or what they're going to do after they graduate that they really don't have time to open their mind to these new topics in those few years. So we're actually finding that reaching kids in the younger grades, uh, junior high school and even the middle school age, um, is really the time to get that passion sparked. And if you can reach a kid at 10 to 12 years old and spark their interest in STEAM technologies, then that kid is gonna have a significant leg up in moving forward and finding opportunities in the workplace of the future, which is going to be entirely tech infused. Totally agree. Mark Kornblatt, founder, chief creative officer and chief innovation officer at the Museum of Future Sports. If somebody wants to find out more about the work that you guys are doing, how can they do that, Mark? Well, we're all over social media, but the easiest way is probably just reach out to us at our website, which is futuresports.io. Sounds good. And if you guys want to find more of my interviews, you can do that right here or go to tanyahall.net. Thanks for watching.